Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us and welcome back to Legislative Landmarks, the online series that explores the history of Connecticut through some of the most significant laws passed right here at the old State House, back when it was one of the two state, state capitals of Connecticut and the seat of the three branches of state government. My name is Mariana Garcia. I'm a museum educator at Connecticut's Democracy Center at Connecticut's old State House, and I'm delighted to be bringing you a very special program today on the public records of the state of Connecticut the actual documents that make up the legislative history of our state. Uh, during the program, I encourage you all to please post your questions and comments on the comment section of this video, and we'll make sure to get to those as uh, the program goes along. And at the very end of the program, if you have a minute, please take a short survey that you can find a link to that in the description of this video. We would really love to hear your feedback. So a state's legislation is a, a testament to its history giving us an insight look at the issues facing the state through the decades. Published by the Connecticut State Library, the public records are a, a transcription of the acts, resolutions, and appointments made by the Connecticut General Assembly going back to the 17th century. And it can be an essential resource for scholars of Connecticut history, legislators, lawyers, genealogists, students, and many others. This publication is a decades long project and it has history almost as fascinating as the documents it seeks, it seeks to preserve and make it, uh, make it accessible to all. Uh, here to talk to us about the project and the history of the public records are Dr. Douglas Arnold and the state archivist, Lisette Pelletier. Dr. Arnold is a professional historian of the American Revolution and the early American Republic. His work has centered on political and constitutional history at the national, state, and local levels. However, he believes that American history can only be understood by looking at the whole picture, which includes society, economy, religion, international relations, and military conflict. Much of Dr. Arnold's work has involved the editing and publication of historical documents, most notably the papers of Benjamin Franklin and the public records of the state of Connecticut. As an independent scholar, author, and editor, he has written for scholarly journals, reference works, local history books, and newspapers. He also served as managing editor of a source book on the United States Constitution and assisted with the, with the establishment of a history and archive center in the city of Brickport. Dr. Arnold holds a degree in American history for, from Bates College and Princeton University. And he has been a faculty member and historical researcher at Yale and was a senior program officer at the National Endowment for the Humanities in Washington, DC. He's also a United States Army veteran and served in Vietnam. Uh, Lisette Pelletier has served as state archivist since 2014. She has 35 years of experience in the field of archives and records management. Prior to coming to the State Library in 1988 as assistant state archivist, she served as a project archivist for the Polish American Heritage Collection at Central Connecticut State University and then as a processing archivist at the Bloomfield campus of the Cigna Insurance Company. In 1998, she took a brief motherhood sabbatical until her youngest child started preschool. Uh, Lisette returned to the State Library as a contract consultant, assistant with the consul consul consolidation of the State Archives collection at an offsite facility, as well as setting up the initial infrastructure for the Historic Documents Preservation Grants Program in the Office of the Public Records Administrator. In 2005, Lisette rejoined the regular uh, Connecticut State Library staff as a public records archivist, working with the state agencies and municipalities to manage these public records. As a state archivist, she chairs the State Historical Records Advisory Board, which supports training and grant opportunities for historical records, uh, preservation, and improves access to Connecticut's rich uh, documentary history, uh, heritage. So uh, welcome. Both of you, Lisette and Douglas, uh, we're going to start with Lisette, who's going to be giving us a brief uh, historical context for the state records and the documents that it makes up. Oops. Thank you very much, Marianne. All right. Just waiting for my slides. There we go. Okay. Can you hit the run the program button? Uh, 
Okay. All right, so when Marianne and uh, Rebecca Tabor approached us about doing a program on the public records of the state of Connecticut series, um, we thought it'd be helpful for me to give a brief, brief history of the series. Uh, I didn't want to read off a timeline of events that would be boring for me and for you. So like often happens, once I begin looking into the story behind the story, including the personalities and processes, I found that I had way more than 10 minutes of information. My research has uncovered many intriguing um, questions to be explored for the future. What are the public records of the state of Connecticut? If you look at the statutory definition of public record today, they are, quote, any recorded data or information relating to the conduct of the public's business, whether such data or information be handwritten, typed, tape recorded, printed, photostatted, photographed, or recorded by any other method, end quote. From the perspective of this topic, I was struck how well it reflects the evolution of record keeping and technology since the English settlers migrated south from Massachusetts in the early 17th century and set up the various communities that would become Connecticut. For them, the definition of a public record would probably have been, quote, any handwritten document created in the course of the general courts business, but we are speaking specifically about the official records of the positive actions of the General Assembly. And I'm going to leave it to Doug to go into more detail um, about what the collection is. All right. To really appreciate the work that goes into the process, it is important to understand how records were created and managed before the modern era of the 20th century. Mass-produced wood pulp-based paper did not become available um, until the mid uh, till the mid 1800s. During this period, nearly all uh, original records were handwritten on parchment made from animal skins or paper made from recycled cotton or linen fabric. Both required skilled craftsmen were time consuming to produce and the base materials for making them were available in limited quantities. Therefore, paper was conservatively used and every space was filled. Only the most important documents were written in flowery legible script. Quill feathers or sometimes reeds served as writing instruments. Inks, inks were made from various materials on hand. The fountain pen was not invented until 1827 and the ballpoint pen in 1888. The first practical typewriter was not patented until 1868. Much like other new technologies, they took time to come into common usage. Just like today, records accumulated in offices over time. Excuse me, Lisette, I'm so, so sorry to interrupt, but I think we're having an issue with your slides. Uh, are we in the right slide? What slide are you on? Uh, I'm on slide two. Oh, okay. I'm so sorry. Uh, nope, yeah, just let okay. me know when to hit the next yep, one. I'm I will. really sorry to interrupt. <laughs> no, that's okay. All right. So just like today, records accumulated in offices over time. In 1741, uh, things had gotten so bad that the General Assembly ordered the Secretary of the Colony, uh, George Willis, to clean up his office. They offered him five pounds, which is best I can determine is about a little more than $1,600 today, if it was done by the next legislative session. Fire was a constant danger. Officials frequently took their records home and considered them their personal possessions. When they died, the family often recycled the uh, paper for other uses. Later, manuscript collectors would seek out groups or individual items, leaving gaps in the documentary record. As tensions grew between the colonies and the British government, the General Assembly made numerous attempts to retrieve records that had scattered across the colony, recognizing the importance of digital, of documenting legal claims, especially land ownership. The collection of early general records in the state archives reflects these various attempts. Certain key records gathered by Governor Jonathan Trumbull on orders of the General Assembly ended up in the Massachusetts Historical Society when his children sold them after his death. They weren't returned to Connecticut until 1936 during the tercentenary uh, commemoration. But that's another story for another time. Can you advance the uh, next slide, please? 
As the colonies ramped up towards the break with England, certain individuals recognized the need to begin preserving the documents related to the formation of the new country. In 1774, Ebenezer Hazard, a publisher and businessman, began plans to publish a series of volumes of American state papers. Considered the father of documentary editing, he established specific editorial standards and procedures. His two-volume work, Historic, collect historical collections consisting of state papers and other authentic documents intended as materials for a history of the United States of America, that's the actual title, um, was the first published collection of American historical documents. Given all the risks at that time, transcrib transcribing official records and publishing them was viewed as a means of preserving the records and making them ex accessible to the people. Next slide, please. As for the public records of Connecticut, according to our timeline on our website, in 1848, the General Assembly provided funds for the first time to edit and publish the records of the colony of Connecticut. However, if you look at the volumes themselves, they refer to a resolution authorizing the purchase of 250 copies of public records um, of the public records of the colony of Connecticut. James Hammond Trumbull, a distant relative of former Governor Jonathan Trumbull, was editor of the first two volumes. However, according to his biography published in the 1913 edition of the Biographical Memoirs of the National Academy of Sciences, his position as an assistant to the Secretary of State from 1847 to 1853 allowed his, quote, taste for historical studies to lead him to investigate the early history of the state and to utilize the original documents to which he had access. He soon formed the plan of reproducing the more important and interesting of these in a permanent form in print. And in 1950, 1850, excuse me, he edited and published at his own expense the first volume of the public records, end quote. Further research will be needed to determine which version is true. In 1854, the General Assembly authorized the State Library Committee to appoint a state librarian. It offered the appointment to James Hammond Trumbull, who accepted. However, he left after a year and Charles J. J. Hoadley became the state librarian. A fun note, at the time the uh, state library, at that time when, when Hammond and Trumbull were uh, the state librarians, the uh, state library was located in what is now the oddities room in the old state house. In 1856, the General Assembly passed a resolution authorizing purchase copies of the records of the colony of New Haven prior to union with uh, Connecticut. Two volumes were published in 1857 and 1858 um, by Charles Hoadley. Um, the records are not clear if Hoadley started the series before becoming state librarian. Um, and for those of you who are not familiar with Connecticut history, um, Connecticut started out as two separate colonies, New Haven and um, the Connecticut River of Hart, uh, Hartford, Wethersfield, and Windsor, and then they um, joined up to form the colony. Um, Holy completed the remaining 13 volumes of the public records of the colony of Connecticut through October 1776 during his 45 year tenure as the state librarian. He then began work on the public records of the state of Connecticut. According to the preface of the first volume of the series, the 1893 General Assembly passed a resolution authorizing, authorizing publication of the 1776 through 1798 records after the Connecticut Sons of the American Revolution partitioned for its publication. Holy completed volumes one and two, which covered 1776 through 1780. Um, he was the first to uh, add a scholarly introduction to the volumes that put the documents into context and provided some analysis for the reader. Unfortunately, he died before completing volume three. It languished unfinished for 22 years until his brother George E. Hoadley paid for Forrest Morgan of the Connecticut Historical Society to oversee its completion. Holy's obituary in the Hartford Current mentions that his editorial work uh, was important because, quote, some 
through the Carol some documents through the carelessness and liberality of official custodians had become scattered, while others through the greed of collectors had been deprived of their signatures. By his efforts, many of the missing autographs have been regained and replaced, while certain manuscripts, including a large number of muster and payrolls of the early wars, have been restored or definitely located. And it is unclear why his successor as state librarian, George S. Goddard, did not take up the mantle of editor and complete the volume and continue the series. It is most likely that Goddard turned all of his energies into getting a new state library building constructed. That too is another an a question for answer in the future. There was um, a large gap then and in, 18, in 1937, as the state marked the tercentenary, the General Assembly appropriated $4,000 for the biennial budget for the State Library Committee to continue work on the records where the series had ended in 1781. The restart was placed under the supervision of the state historian, a position created for the tercentenary. Two additional special acts in 1941 and 1943 um, ensured the completion um, of the series through volume nine, bringing the documents up to 1799. By statute, the series remains under the purview of the state historian, but the volumes have been published sporadically when the state historian, uh, the university can edit and other funds are available. Two volumes were uh, published in mid 1960s. After a nearly 20 year hiatus, the series resumed with volume 12 under the direction of Dorothy Ann Lipson, um, who was hired by the state historian at that time, Kit Collier. Uh, Doug Arnold joined Dorothy for volume 13. Uh, funding for the project stalled after volume 17, which was published in 2000. Beginning in 2007, the Connecticut State Library has been able to provide funds through the Historic Documents Preservation Fund, which is administered by the Office of the Public Records um, Administrator for volumes 18 through 22. Volume 23 is in the final stages of production, and we look forward to it being made available, hopefully by the end of the year, if, and if not, uh, the begin early of next year. Um, so that concludes my history of the series, and I will turn it over to current editor, Doug Arnold. Okay, thank you very much, Mariana and Lizette. Um, do we have the slides? You can just uh, move to the next page, please. Okay. Um, well, uh, Lisette gave a good overview of the history of the Public Records Project. And um, as she mentions, I've been the editor of recent volumes. Um, so far, I've edited uh, t t 10 volumes which have been published, volumes 20, uh, 13 to 22. And I'm currently uh, working on the next, the next volume, which is volume 23. And taken together, these 11 volumes will cover the years 1806 to 1826. Um, Lizette, uh, Mariana gave a good overview at the very beginning of this presentation about the, the people who can use these, who can find useful information in these volumes, research, uh, ranging from research by scholars of Connecticut history and United States history to local historians, um, to genealogists, uh, to other members of the public, to lawyers, and to legislators who are studying the state's laws. Um, so I won't dwell on that. What I think I should do here is basically talk quickly about what, I, what the major components of a public records volume, and it stayed very much in this form um, for a long time. The central part of the volume is the text of what we call the public records manuscript, which is a manuscript register of all the um, acts, resolutions, and appointments made by Connecticut's General Assembly, basically kept in the same form in the state secretary's office over a very long period of time, beginning in the 17th century and going into the 
into the 1800s. Um, the register, is, as I said, has been kept in this form, same form for a long time, which means that the text of the volumes have very similar appearance in terms of the different sections that are, that are involved. We also are able to publish supplementary documents as necessary, and um, I'm, I wouldn't really consider it a supplementary document, but one other major text we did publish in volume 19, which covered the year 1818, was the, were the records of the Constitutional Convention of 1818. So that one volume covered just one year, uh, two legislative sessions of that year plus the Constitutional Convention. Um, in general, the volumes cover two, a two-year period. And um, uh, before, 18, um, before 1819, there were two legislative sessions a year. Um, after the new constitution, there was only one per year. So right now, there's one, uh, there are two legislative sessions covering two years, um, two, uh, covering two years in a given volume. You want me to get it? Yeah. Um, um, the volumes can also contain supplementary documents, and what these have tended to be um, have been um, have been transcriptions of legislative debates, um, and uh, probably even and, and pro even more notably in recent volumes, the messages to the legis annual messages to the legislature by uh, Governor Oliver Walcott which are fascinating documents. Walcott was kind of a 19th century, 18th and 19th century policy wonk who wrote incredibly um, detailed analyses of public policy in Connecticut throughout this period. Um, so those are supplementary documents. Then each volume has a, thor a thorough uh, analytical index to allow people to identify, to, to locate names, localities, um, topics, other, other matters covered in the volume. Then there are informational annotations, which, um, which are attached to different uh, acts and resolutions within the text, which, uh, in which give supplementary infor information. And finally, and, and you'll note this is out of order, there's an introduction, I tend to, uh, uh, which uh, gives the historical context and provides additional information. Um, I, um, I actually trained as a historical editor on the papers of Benjamin Franklin at Yale before I came, I came in, before I took over this project. And we always had a, a sort of a, a, a credo of the things that were the most important parts of the editor's duty. The editor's duty, main duty, most important duty is to provide an accurate transcription of the actual historical text for the user. Then the second most important thing the editor does is provide a comprehensive analytical index so that the user can get at the information that's in, uh, in the text. Then there are informational annotations, which provide, as I said, additional information. And finally, there are additional factual information, I should say. And finally, there's the introduction, setting the historical context. And this is the case. In my case, these introductions, um, these introductions provide I, I would say, um, for recent volumes, uh, the, 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 during, during the times uh, my predecessors and I have edited this series since the middle of the 20th century, these introductions provide some of the most detailed histories of, um, the, uh, of, of the state during that period. But one thing I should say is, why do I sort of list the introduction last among all of these things that the editor provides? Because large parts of the introduction are historical interpretations by the editor. In the case of the recent volumes, historical interpretations by me. And as we all know, historical interpretations change over time. And it may very well be that someone comes up later and writes the history of this period in a different way than I would choose to write it. So what I would say is that the parts of these uh, volumes that are going to, be, going to be lasting are the ones that provide the basic, basic textual and factual information, and which um, and, and and which provide an, an index by which to access it. Um, I would. I, I, this is a bit of a challenge to try to summarize what's now thirty, almost thirty-five years of work by me on these volumes that I've edited. But I, what I thought I would, what what really struck me as I thought about what my career as editor of this volume is, how privileged I've been to actually been able to edit this series during three very distinct 
um, but different periods of Connecticut's early history in the early part of the 19th century. And if I could have the second slide, please. The first period that I edited was the period I called the period of Federalist dominance. Um, actually, the Federalist Party was dominant in Connecticut well before 1806, but I took over the project in 1806, so that's why I've got the 1806 date there. And this period of, of Federalist dominance was the period of what we know as the Standing Order of Connecticut. It was basically the old political and constitutional, um, religious, social order of the state, which was established under the, the Royal Charter of 1662. Um, and uh, as many of you might know, Connecticut did not change its Royal Charter um, after American independence. It did not write, a, not write a state constitution. It basically wrote the king and the and parliament out of the government and continued to operate under the old colonial order, which had a very different kind of constitutional structure than what was emerging in the other American states at the time of American independence. I can't go into any detail about this, but the state also had the public support, um, financial support for religious congregations, for religious preaching, an arrangement that favored the, con the congregational church. So this is a very, very different kind of um, a kind of political system than one would find in other states at the time. This period was up to, up to 1815 was characterized by partisan rivalry between the Federalist Party, which was derived from the old National Federalist Party of George Washington and Alexander Hamilton and the, their Jeffersonian Republican opponents. The Jeffersonians took control of the national government in 1801. Um, but the Federalists actually stayed in power in Connecticut until 1815. There was actually quite a vigorous partisan competition between the two parties up to roughly 1805 and the first half of the first decade of, of the 19th century. But, um, and I can't go into any detail here, but the Federalists managed to defeat an attempt by, uh, the, uh, by the Jeffersonians to uh, write a new state constitution in 1805. And then um, after, um, after, basically, it's a, it was as a result of um, the foreign policy of the national federal uh, Jefferson Republican government, um, which was very inimical, to, or at least the, a lot of people in New England thought that the Jeffersonian policies were very inimical to, to, uh, to the economic interests of, the, of New England and Connecticut, uh, that actually managed to led to strengthen Federalist control. Uh, basically, a Federalist clamp got down over debate. Um, a lot of, polit a lot of new Jeffersonian uh, newspapers disappeared. Uh, there was a very strong Federalist control in all parts of the state government. And this eventually led into the um, War of 1812, which was, of course, a war declared by the National Jeffersonian Administration of James Madison, in which the Federalists in New England deeply opposed. Uh, the Federalists opposed the, uh, opposed the War of 1812. Um, there were actually attempts to nullify the um, actions of the federal government during that period in, in New England. And the culmination was the famous Hartford Convention of 1814, which, um, which did propose uh, constitutional amendments to uh, curtail the powers of the fed federal government, which was, also, which was um, in the hands of the Jeffersonians. But the Federalists overreached, and the fact that the war was continued without, even though the war was basically a stalemate, it ended up with an upsur it ended with an upsurge of American patriotism, and the Federalists were looking as if they had been um, were, were looking unpatriotic uh, at, at the end of um, at the end of the war. So, if we could go to the next slide, please. This next led to the next period, which I call the Reform Era. Uh, the, the, the central political development of this period was the defeat of the Federalists by what I call a reform coalition. It consisted of um, members of the old Jeffersonian Party, it could, uh, of um, younger Federalists and uh, federal, uh, who were disenchanted with um, with um, the policies, the, the very uh, with the um, with the anti-nationalist policies of, um, of many of the Federalists during the war, and it was they were joined by. Who, who, the religious dissenting groups, the groups of um, uh, the, the, um, 
religious groups who were not part of the Congregationalist Standing Order, uh, Episcopalians, Baptists, Quakers, and others. And um, that, the uh, volume, volume 18 of the public records in particular shows how the very, how the um, reformers managed to take control one after another of every branch of the, uh, of the state government. And, they, and by the, by the uh, middle of 1818, they'd reached a point where they controlled all branches of the government and they were able to call a, co a convention to, uh, to write a new state constitution. This um, new constitution was very much in the American mainstream, um, unlike the old uh, charter-based government. And it also, the, uh, the constitution also marked the ending of public financing of religion. Often this is called disestablishment. Um, the disestablishment of religion. In point of fact, the religious situation was extremely complex, but there was no doubt that under the old standing order, the Congregationalist Church had privileges and power in the state, uh, that the other religious dominations were, uh, denominations were, um, uh, felt disadvantaged them. And finally, the reformers um, ca carried through um, a series of uh, further reforms, which the Jeffersonian, the, uh, the Jeffersonian Republicans had started calling for, had started calling for, much earlier to equalize the basis of taxation, to um, uh, to, to reform the um, to, to, to reform the the, the the fiscal system, and other things happened around the same time. In order to uh, in order to um, in, 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 in um, undertaking these reforms, which led to the state constitution and in the constitution itself, the vote, the franchise was opened up to basically all white males. And, um, where, and uh, whereas there have been various other restrictions on voting before then. So uh, there were a lot of reforms at this era that sort of brought America more into what I would call the American mainstream. And um, the adoption of the state constitution is well known um, the disestablishment of, uh, of the church is well known. Um, what, I did, uh, what we did manage to do in the volume on the Constitutional Convention is we managed to, uh, to provide a complete, uh, a complete text of all the newspaper debate, of all the uh, debates in the State Constitutional Convention. Uh, this was a period where, they, where, the, um, where a political attention of the public was, was heightened. There were many newspapers competing with one another. There were Federalist-leaning newspapers. There were Jeffersonian-leaning newspapers. Each of the newspapers had a different set of versions of the debates, um, which uh, which they would publish. And what we managed in that volume, volume 19 of the series, was to bring all these debates together. And one of the things that was fascinating was not not was what was not not only what was present in the way the different newspapers presented the debates, but what was absent. The Jeffersonian papers had pr uh, uh, printed virtually no debates about the uh, handling of religion, whereas the Federalists, who were very much attached to the old polit political and religious order, made printed all the debates they could to show the dastardly things that, that they thought the, Je the Jeffersonians were doing to the religious state of, uh, of, of, of to the religious conditions in Connecticut. So. I, uh, Comparing those sets of debates can be very interesting in seeing how the different parties approached um, approached um, uh, the, 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 kind of the issues of the day. Um, when I talked about the um, when I talked about the franchise, I think one thing that's important to point out is I use the word white male. One thing that happened throughout the throughout the um, United States during the early what we now call the early gen the era of good feelings, the early Jacksonian period, was there was an explicit attempt in many states to disenfranchise African American Americans and, 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 and other people of color from voting. So the words white male explicitly started appearing in constitutions around the uh, United States at the time. And uh, this was actually, it was, it was in the state constitution of 1818 but it actually, but that voting restriction had actually been been um, uh, established by the Federalist Legislature much earlier in 1814, and try as hard as we can, not only uh, the not only myself and my my and, and, and my assistants, but other scholars, we've simply not been able to find any discussion of why it happened in 1814, 
it's one of those uh, lacunae that, um, that, that are very frustrating for a historian. So the end of the reform era, uh, oh, I should just add one other thing, volume, um, volume 19, which covers 1819 and 1820, um, as I said, the, the adoption of the state constitution and the end of public financing for religion is pretty well known. But what is not as well known is the importance of the tax and, 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 and other economic reforms in those years as part of the overall Republican reform package. And in many ways, uh, the volume 19, which covered the, the second stage of reform, was one of the most exciting ones for me to do because these were relatively um, uh, untold stories that, um, that we, we got to tell both in the annotations to that volume and in, um, in, in the introduction. So now could we go to the next slide? The third phase of the period that I've worked on is what I call Connecticut in the American 19th century. Because quite frankly, Connecticut was quite, a, quite an odd case in the early American Republic in terms of its constitutional and religious order. And in many ways with the new constitution and with the cessation of some of those old controversies, uh, Connecticut starts acting and behaving much more like a, a, a mainstream American state during this period. So you find out that uh, Connecticut is becoming more engaged with national trends during this period. Um, uh, it, it, during this era, it seems like the business of America is definitely becoming business, and that definitely becomes a, a central theme in the um, volumes that I've recently edited, starting with volume um, um, with volume 20, uh, 21, 22. Um, actually, I meant volume, I'm sorry, I, I misspoke about a volume number. It's volume 20 that covers 1819 and 1820, which I just mentioned. But starting with volume, uh, with volume 21, we start seeing even, even more attention to economic development. There had been some transportation improvements in terms of um, turnpikes uh, starting from the 1790s. But during these years, the first half of the 1820s, there's a, a, a surge in um, steam navigation, steamboats both on the Connecticut River, the Lusitonic, and on Long Island Sound. Uh, several canal projects, none of them particularly successful, are developed, and you start getting the first hints that, uh, that, that, that railroads will eventually become central to the, um, to, the state's, to the state's history. Governor Walcott, for example, even though there weren't any railroads chartered, chartered until the 1830s in Connecticut. Governor Walcott, as early as 1825, in one of his messages, is, start, is talking about how railroads have, 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 are, are, the, are the future as far as transportation goes. Also economic development. There have been manufacturing in terms of cotton mills, um, especially in the eastern part of the state, again, since uh, even before the turn of the 19th century. But in these, in these um, volumes, one starts seeing metal um, uh, manufacture, iron, other uh, uh, copper, other types of uh, manufacturing taking off. Insurance, there have been insurance before, but some of the most famous insurance companies are formed during this period, including the Aetna. And urbanization, the cities start getting bigger. In the volume I'm editing right now, there are, certain, uh, there are, um, there are projects to, uh, to, to um, to, to install gas lighting in Hartford. Um, there are all sorts of indications that cities are getting bigger, both in terms of their progress and modernization, but probably also in terms of social problems that which, be, which are associated with urbanization. And also during the period, you see the beginnings of what we know as the famous reform movements of the antebellum, the pre-Civil War period, temperance, um, uh, anti-slavery, and in, especially in the volume I'm editing right now, prison reform, when the old Newgate prison is closed down and the new Connecticut State prison is started in Wethersfield. So uh, it, it, it's, it just, it, it, I'm, I'm a historian of the early American Republic who came to, from, came to Connecticut history after being more of a generalist in the United States history of that period. And it just feels to me that, like Connecticut has become part of the um, part of the American mainstream in a very exciting way. Um, I, I had expected to think that to, to, to um, get, I'd been given the impression that Connecticut might be kind of a backwater. The major history of this period after 1818 
what's called a neglected period in Connecticut history, which is not, not, a, not, not the best way of describing the period. I've just been very excited with what was actually going on in Connecticut during this time. So those are some of the most important general themes, all of which are documented in large ways and small in these volumes that I've edited. But I thought before I close today, I would give you a couple of um, examples of things that I've discovered that are on a much, much more, um, on, on a much smaller scale, but I think are illustrative of what we, you can discover in these, in these uh, documents. And especially when I see something in the public records and then I research it in the supporting documents at the state library and in the contemporary newspapers, some stories start coming out that are that are of interest in their own way, in their own in their own right and are not fully represented in the text of the public records manuscript itself. Let me give you one example, um, or I'll maybe I'll, I'll I'll give you as many examples as I can in, in my remaining minutes. But um, uh, an 1820 act required an enumeration of the stu of, of of children of school age every year. So that they could get a so, so that a school district, school society, or, or as they call it, school societies, get a proportion of the state school money, and um, a lot of um, localities had a hard time understanding this act, understanding the deadline of submitting this information, and um, and uh, coming up and, and getting it in on time. And I had one one matter of the South Hollow School District in the town of Heartland, Connecticut. The, uh, the school committee of that district omitted to make the enumeration of students before the time set by the law. And they write to the, um, they, 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 they petition the assembly to allow them their school money, even though they didn't submit the, um, didn't submit the, uh, the, the accounting of students on time. And what happened, I'll just read what, what I discovered by looking at the newspapers. During the House's consideration of this petition, Sheldon Levitt, he's a representative from Bethlehem, stated that, quote, great negligence prevailed among the district committees, end quote, in complying with the requirements of the 1820 law that I, I, I just mentioned. Levitt contended that the law had been, in effect, long enough from 1820 to this was 1826 for its provisions to be known. To counter the negligence, uh, Levitt argued that some check should be put upon the practice, an example should be set that would induce school committees to do their duty. Roger, Levitt was answered by Roger Huntington of Norwich, Morris Woodruff of Litchfield, and Ralph I. Ingersoll of New Haven, this is all in the House of Representatives debate, who argued that rejecting such requests for relief would, quote, would only, quote, punish the children for the fault of the committee, end quote, um, depriving them, uh, quote, of the means of sustaining an education, end quote. Failure to grant relief would also increase the financial burdens on poor people. And, the, uh, and this negligence, though unfortunate, was always, quote, accidental or inevitable, and quote, no other mode of relief could be obtained. Um, um, in addition, one of the speakers noted that Levitt, the guy who had objected to this, um, uh, who, who would say, who had found that the um, the school districts were lax in making this enumeration, was living in a state of single single blessedness, and he did not feel as a parent felt upon the subject. Single blessedness, of course, was a, 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 a contemporary euphemism for being a bachelor. Um, uh, let's see if I have another minute or two. I'm not trying to give one or two more of these. Um, in, um, in, eight, in 1826, there was a petition from a William T. Gager of Farmington um, showing that he had, um, it was basically, he was on a, ch a charge and held on a, bond, on, on, on a charge of manslaughter. And bond, his bond had become forfeited and a suit commenced thereupon against himself and he was praying for remission of this and that he might, might be discharged from the costs incurred on and from the, um, and, and, and from the charge of manslaughter. And the assembly decided to grant, to grant that, um, grant his request. 
But the background of this was the following. The background of this matter is thoroughly documented in the legislative papers. This was, in brief, Gager and a number of other young men had been engaged by local authorities in May 1825 to assist in the apprehension of Alfred Rowe, a mentally ill person who had recently left the retreat for the insane in Hartford. Rowe had subsequently killed Noah Dyer Bird of Farmington. During nighttime confusion, the young man, Gager, had fired his musket and accidentally killed Drayton Badwell, who was also assisting in the apprehension of Roe. A legislative committee summarized the fact, facts and recommended that the, uh, that the um, and recommended the assembly grant, grant, grant clemency. Um, and the final example is deals with the tangled history of slavery in Connecticut and other and, and, and other American states. There was a, a resolution in 1825 that the governor is authorized to, uh, to and requested to provide for the conveyance of Peter Augustus, a Negro boy, as the as the uh, document said, says from the state of South Carolina to Weathersfield in this state, from whence he was unlawfully transported out of the state for the purpose of enslaving him, and that the expense incurred under the authority of his excellence and the premises be liquidated by the controller. And then by going to the governor's um, journal, where these uh, where various documents related to these, this case were summarized, we learned that um, James Fortune of Weathersfield had sold Peter Augustus's time-limited indenture to mercantile captain Simeon Eldridge of New York, who had transported um, uh, Peter Augustus to South Carolina and sold him into slavery. Apparently, the Reverend James Berlin, the purchaser in South Carolina, discovered that the sale was not legitimate because of Peter's free status in Connecticut. Berlin brought the matter to the attention of a local vigilance committee charged with monitoring the slave trade and brought suit against Eldridge. Governor Walcott proceeded to make arrangements for the transportation of Peter Augustus back to Connecticut. And those are just a couple of examples of some of the fascinating little stories that one can discover by delving deeper into the um, uh, legislative, supporting legislative papers and into the newspapers, which gives much additional um, information about the um, uh, about these, uh, these these stories. I would say the last one about Peter Augustus, Connecticut, and uh, South Carolina. I think this story almost uh, would benefit from a more extended scholarly uh, treatment in the form of an article with research in South Carolina as well as in Connecticut. So that's another thing I've, I've tried to do in these volumes is to provide enough information about an interesting development that other researchers might be able to take up and develop on their own. So it's, I would just say it's been a privilege to edit this series. I've been happy to be able to um, to see the Connecticut to see this project through three different major phases of Connecticut's history, and I'm always really happy to to discover these small stories, which really shed light on individuals um, and, and within the state, within the towns, within the localities. So thank you all for uh, being here tonight. All right, thank you both so much. This was so interesting. I really, I'm just fascinated by this project and how it really, uh, these uh, records really touch upon pretty much every single aspect of Connecticut history because, you know, these laws, they they talk about everything, everything you could possibly think about. You like science, they talk about science sometimes. You're interested in slavery, they absolutely talk about slavery. It's a treasure trove of potential research topics. So we do have a couple of questions from the audience. Let's see if I can sort of ask them in order. All right, so Laura Smith would like to know, are the records available in the CTDA? I see only volumes 20 and 21. So where, where could people access all of these uh, records? Um, I, could, could Lizette say a few things about who, where, where the volumes are being distributed these days? Yeah, uh, electronically right now, um, they're in a variety of places. Um, 
the the CTDA is the most recent location where they've been placed. If you go to the um, state library um, catalog online catalog, um, it'll provide you links. Um, a lot of a lot of the older materials are in the Hathi Trust. Um, I am not sure if that's something that limits our ability to place materials into CTDA, um, but we will have to, that's something we will look into. Um, some of the other volumes are in the um, internet archives um, and have been placed there by others besides ourselves. So um, I will, uh, I will uh, see if we can do a better job on the Connecticut web, uh, State Library website to direct people to um, where they are available. I see a question from John Rogers about the environmental context for Connecticut political development. And mm -hmm. as, as didn't an unusual cold spell um, uh, lead up to the constitutional reform era. You know, I, that's certainly true. I mean, I, I noted in the introduction to uh, volume 18, which started with, with 1816, that 1816 was what was called the year without a summer, an unusually cold spell um, throughout much of the much of the world, actually. And um, whether I, I think I leave it up to others to speculate on what, what impact that might have on the on the political situation, but it was certainly a real. It's, it was certainly something that was very noticeable at the time. And it had an effect on crops. It had an effect on, on, on many other elements of economic activity. So. Thank you very much. We have another question. Uh, I have a question here from Arthur. He asks, what year did Connecticut approve or authorize banks to issue their own banknotes? Uh, they've been issuing them for as long as I've edited these volumes, so I actually don't have an answer to that. Um, there's a, certainly a lot of controversy in my era about banking and banknotes. As you might recall, banking and um, currency became a major issue during the Jacksonian era, the so-called bank war, and um, there, was all, uh, there was always a critique of, black, black, of, black, of um, unregulated banknotes um, because uh, given the monetary situation in the early American Republic, um, the, uh, only the United States could issue currency. But in point of fact, the notes issued by banks started to become a de facto, a de facto currency. And um, in the volume I'm editing right now, Governor Walcott has about 10 pages of his um, annual message having to do with um, the problems in, ba in, in banking procedures. Uh, during uh, during this period, he was very much against small bank notes. He would he wanted larger bank notes. He thought they were that they were that they were less liable to um, uh, to, uh, to to various problems. So uh, certainly, the question of bank notes and their role in this is, is a fraught one, both in the country as a whole, and uh, and in Connecticut, and very much a concern of um, Governor Walcott. I could spend an entire hour talking about Governor Oliver Walcott, by the way. So uh, there's just so much to talk about in, in, in any given time. Thank you very much. Uh, here we have another question. Uh, did you approach each volume differently and what did you consider before starting work in each one? Um, because the document itself, the public records register is, it's, it, it, it's formulaic and it isn't because it's, it's formulaic in the fact that it, it has lists of appointments, it has acts, it has resolutions, and these all are the, the kinds of uh, the kinds of materials, the three basic kinds of positive actions that are produced by the legislature. So you'll actually see that the overall structure of a given legislative session looks very much the same from volume to volume. I think that the major difference is the la this current volume is 100 pages longer about than the previous one. Um, basically because there are just some extra extraordinary long incorporations of business enterprises, particularly corporations that were that were um, uh, uh, th that were working on clearing navigation up the Connecticut River as far as mid Vermont. Um, 
and uh, the, the, some of these these very elaborate uh, incorporating documents go on and on. So th that's probably the main reason why this one is um, this one is longer. But um, as I said, one of the fascinating things about the current volumes is just the vigor of um, uh, of the state's economy at the time. Um, Connecticut seems to me, from my vantage point, to be anything but a backwater at this time. Thank you very much. And uh, how long does the actual transcribing work take? And how many people are actually transcribing each during each volume? Um, there's only one. I, I actually live in Washington, D.C. I've been down here ever since I took a job with the, um, the National Endowment for the Humanities back in 1990. And um, although I'd started this project, my first volume of this project came out in 88. And basically, since I've been down here in recent volumes, I've just been hiring one of the many legal transcription uh, services in DC to transcribe the um, volumes. And I've now got one that I've used on about three or four consecutive volumes and they're very experienced. But then I have an associate. He and I sit down with the um, photocopy of the manuscript, which is provided by the state library, and we read against the transcription. So, um, and then I do some additional reading against the transcription myself later. So it's a, a one basic two-person reading and then, um, and then another series of readings, uh, uh, another re series of some readings by myself. Um, uh, we're not an editorial factory like the Benjamin Franklin papers where I worked for. And I don't have the financial resources we, that, uh, that a project like that can have. So we, we do the best we can with what we have. And I think we've I think we've maintained a very, a very high standard. Thank you very much. Uh, Lisette, here's a question I think for you. Where are the original documents then? And are they still available for people to, to see, even if we have already the transcriptions? Um, well, they are in, in the, the state archives. They're in uh, record group one, which is the early records uh, series. Um, because of the because they are so old and in a, f a fragile condition, um, we tend to have people use the the digital copy of the records, um, if if available, or they have been microfilmed early on. So uh, generally, unless the um, the re the reformatted version is illegible. Um, they're not available to be, you know, handled and looked at. Um, uh, if if a scholar or a researcher does need to has a question and does need to to look at an individual volume, um, they can make a request through the history and genealogy staff, and archive staff will look at the volume and determine if it can be um, handled, if it's safe to be handled. Thank you very much. And I think we have time for one final question. Uh, what advice would you give someone who's just starting out, who has never used these records before, and they're just browsing around to see if they can find some kind of uh, research topic? What, re uh, what, what would you tell them? Where, where, does your, where should they start, do you think? That's an interesting question. Um, as I said, some of the factual annotations, um, given the time frame and the funding for getting this done, some of the stories that we tell in annotations are only partially told, are, are basically only guideposts for what more should be done. So sometimes looking at the annotations and finding some stories that are very interesting in there, very often I think some of these will lead to a much longer projects. I know that. I know that uh, several footnotes in these volumes have inspired others to write articles about those specific developments. But I would suggest if you have a general idea of what sort of topics you're interested in, uh, pick up a couple of the volumes and go to those indexes and those volumes about those particular topics and see where they lead you. Uh, I think that would be the best way. Um, because obviously, I think when you research something, it should be something that you're really interested in yourself. And uh, by f identifying your own interests and then seeing what the indexes tell you about what, what is available in this series will lead you into, into some productive areas. 
All right, thank you very much, Douglas Lissett. This has been really, really interesting. And I think we're all just really looking forward to just looking through those indexes to see what we can find, what nuggets of really interesting stories we can find in the public records. Uh, so once again, thank you both. Thank you everybody for joining us. Uh, before we sign off, I would really like to take just a quick minute to uh, tell you a little bit about some future uh, events that we're going to be having here at the Old State House. All right, so on uh, June the 16th, Wednesday, June the 16th at noon, we will be having our next conversation at noon called People Preserving Connecticut's Past, Meet the New State Librarian and State Archaeologist. And we'll be having a conversation with Dr. Sarah Sportsman, who's our new state archaeologist, and Deborah uh, Shander, who's our new state librarian. And uh, on Tuesday, June tw the 22nd, at also at noon, we'll be having our uh, next conversation at noon, Historic Preservation and Diversity. And uh, I would also encourage you to, oh, can we go back to the other one, please, real quick. Yeah, I would also encourage you to uh, join us for our upcoming um, Farmers Markets and Summer Concert Series. that will be starting on June the 15th through October 8th. Um, our very first uh, summer concert will be on Tuesday, June the 15th, which will also be the first day of our farmer's market. All the subsequent uh, summer concerts will be on the Friday of each week, but the farmer's markets will be held every Tuesday and Friday. And uh, also do make sure to check out our open house day on uh, June the 12th, noon through 4 p.m. We'll be having a special concert by the Balkan Brothers at 1.30. And uh, again, thank you both, uh, Douglas and Lisette, for joining us tonight. Uh, and thank you, everybody else, for joining us. We hope to see you again in a future program. Mm -hmm.